Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. This famous quote is taken from Theodore Kaczynski's manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future. Within the manifesto, good old Uncle Ted condemns the mass industrial production and consumerism that came about after the Enlightenment, the advent of modern capitalism. In his analysis, he makes the entirely resonant claim that technological innovation and automation has eliminated the need for most physical and emotional work. In pre-industrial societies, the meaning one found in living came from the sweat and toil of producing. People could see their crops and children grow in real cycles. The natural rhythm of the earth was godly. What do we have now? Food and clothing that takes care of our biological needs is mass-produced from god knows where. All of our entertainment and emotional needs are taken care of by algorithm and supply chain. Netflix will recommend a new show after you've rewatched The Office for a fifth time. Google will recommend that you buy a new product after its careful analysis of your search queries. And the viability of you getting a lease is determined by your credit score. How the hell does your credit score reflect the person you really are? I don't know. This very video might have been recommended to you via YouTube's algorithm. Kaczynski asserts that technology has stripped the modern man of any real sense of freedom to choose beyond the economic. In my opinion, Kaczynski's analysis is too harsh on post-industrial economies. People have always been bombarded with propaganda that pushes ideas and products. However, the sheer invasiveness and control of these propagandistic forces make previous theological and political systems look puny by comparison. It's hard to imagine the impact Google search results have had on the way you think and the information you absorb. It is even harder to comprehend all the way your data is traded, manipulated, and used to sell you garbage without even registering the presence of it on a Silicon Valley spreadsheet. If your biological and emotional needs are taken care of by the great economic global machine, we create what Kaczynski called surrogate goals. We go to the gym, we go mountain climbing, we make YouTube videos. We set up hobbies and passions that are not necessary to our survival, but make us feel like we are being productive. Our deprivation from the power processes is turned into a slot to be filled with distractions. Soren Kierkegaard said that since boredom advances and boredom is the root of all evil, no wonder then that the world goes backwards, that evil spreads. This can be traced back to the very beginning of the world. The gods were bored, therefore they created human beings. Kierkegaard believed that in order to cope with boredom, we must turn to God. He starts the problem of kings. A king can visibly do whatever he wants, believe whatever he wants to believe, and possess anything he wishes to possess, short of the sword of Damocles falling on his head. What is a king to do when he can do anything? Kierkegaard suggests that the king must reject materialism and nihilism that consumption and hedonism brings, and embrace the transcendent godliness of the divine. Submission to God is the only cure to consumerism. After proclaiming the death of God, Nietzsche asserts that the only solution to the problem of kings is culture. Nietzsche believed that high culture, like the Wagnerian epic operas of his day, deify the transcendent willed power of a community without necessarily having a god. Returning to surrogate goals, it's not a coincidence that the early 20th century's environmentalist movement coincided with rapid urbanization and industrialization. Men like Theodore Roosevelt created national parks and encouraged men to get involved in sports and rugged individualist activities so that people could challenge themselves physically and mentally. The martial warrior spirit would be kept on life support by the Boy Scouts. Be an office worker during the week, be a mountain climbing adventurer on the weekends as a release valve. As Tyler Duren of Fight Club responds to this nihilistic fake consumption, he, he says, maybe self-improvement isn't the answer. Maybe self-destruction is the answer. Are these circuit goals even sustainable in any real sense of the term? Leading primitivist philosopher Derek Jensen suggests that the rise of civilization and industrial alienation by proxy is the rise of cities. The growth of cities and domination of abstracted social hierarchies and the increasingly niche realms of competency driven by the division of labor demands increasingly demanding resource extraction. In order to fuel cities like New York, London, and Sydney, materials and foodstuffs must be extracted and processed through increasingly economically intensive practices and interconnected international supply chains. To support the economic financial hub with millions of denizens like New York, armies of miners, farmers, and industrial workers must pillage the environment ad infinitum. Jensen rejects human supremacist thinking and any notion of extractive cities of consumption. I do not. I'm a human supremacist and I'd actually like to live a meaningful life, thank you very much. However, this does not obfuscate the real problems of living under one vast and ecumenical, truly global civilization. If we live under one vast neoliberal economic civilization, what is going to happen when things fall apart? 
all civilizations die eventually. We will not live under the same levels of extraction and consumption forever. Kaczynski suggests two futures. Quote, the industrial technological society must survive or it will break down. If it survives, it may eventually achieve a low level of physical and psychological suffering, but only after passing through a long and painful period of adjustment, and only at the cost of permanently reducing human beings and other living organisms to engineered products and mere cogs in the social machine. If the system breaks down, the consequences will still be very painful. So, if it is to break down, it had best break down sooner rather than later. The first option is a nightmarish Nick Land techno-commercialist cyberpunk dystopia. It is the Matrix. The second option is a Nick Land accelerationist philosophy featuring a Mobugian civilizational hard reset. The first option is a future in which Jacques Lull's concept of technique has completely taken over. In his essay, The Technological Order, Alol outlines the neoliberal civilization's ethos of rational efficiency. Technique is defined as the totality of methods rationally arrived at, and having absolute efficiency for any given stage of development in every field of human activity. Everything must be pre-planned, and viability must be derived at through a vigorous cost-benefit analysis. Then, a rigorous bureaucracy must rubber stamp every plan and procedure at, at all levels of the follow-through. The Enlightenment has taught man that the world must be put under a microscope, and so can God. Subjective utility and value judgments must be quantified and sold in order to maximize efficiency. Technique is planning and social planners that will expel God from discourse because nothing must be unknown especially the values of nature. Unknowable human nature must be analyzed by Faustian men. Your values must be placed on a spreadsheet in order to maximize efficiency within what Deleuze calls desired production machines. Government structures, corporations, and even your leisure time do not have a nature. There are merely beans being counted to maximize hedonic fun. This is not to discount economics or social sciences as fields of study. Everything and everyone acts within the immutable bylaws of business, but it is nonetheless strange to ask what the marginal utility of a magnolia is. It is psychopathic to ask what the benefit of letting whales, lions, giraffes, and zebras exist is. We humans have the power to wipe out any other animal species off the face of the earth if there was no utility in their existence. In Kenya, there is a massive poaching problem on the savanna wildlife reserves. Protected large game is killed, carried off, and sold to desperate poachers. Meanwhile, there is a severe lack of funding for guards on the reserves. One solution is to let a small select group of western hunters kill sustainable numbers of endangered animals. There is a large community of wealthy hunters that will pay thousands of dollars to kill a giraffe. The reserves are privatized and the owners profit by giving hunters permission to kill a select number of animals in exchange for thousands of dollars. This money is spent on security guards to protect the rest of the herd. Private owners care much more about protecting their investment from poachers than government bureaucracies. Everybody wins. Poachers are hired as security guards. Western doctors can show off their trophies. Endangered animals are thriving on these privatized nature reserves, and libertarians can boast about how the profit motive saves endangered species. Now imagine if this logic was applied to humans. That is the premise of the movie Soylent Green. Encouraging unnatural deaths to fuel unnatural living. Life has no moral meaning to anyone beyond its continuation. The majesty of no nature is despoiled by the tainted marketplace, but pragmatically, the market works. In Fyodor Dostoevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov, there is a short story within the grander narrative called The Grand Inquisitor. In this short story, Jesus is resurrected during the Spanish Inquisition. Jesus miraculously gives a blind man his sight back, and brings a child back to life in front of his mother. The Catholic Church cannot allow this to go on, so they imprison Jesus. The man who imprisoned Jesus, the Grand Inquisitor, tells him that he is obsolete. If Jesus had chosen to be the king of mankind and force the world to become moral under his benevolent hand, the Inquisition and the Church would not be necessary. Political freedom and free will allows for the worst individualistic characteristics of man to run wild. The Grand Inquisitor tells Jesus that while some noble people may follow Jesus' example, almost all will either fail or fall to the newest fad. If left to their own devices, people will eat each other. While some true believers are willing to starve and remain moral, most desperate starving people will sell Jesus out for a loaf of bread. It is in that moral failing that the church comes in. The hierarchy of the church provides the poor with bread and enforces the posthumous morality of Jesus. This system is much more effective than leading by example. For that reason, the Grand Inquisitor sentences Jesus to death but not before Jesus forgave the Inquisitor with a kiss and a smile. The hierarchy 
whether it is the Catholic Church or global capital, will provide the poor with welfare and support the reigning morality. That is the natural order of things. But the specific policy positions of the elite class's morality is up for grabs. That is where the spiteful mutant theory comes in. In many of his videos, Dr. Edward Dutton discusses the dysgenic effects of outgroup selection and, and low child mortality rates. In the case of Ireland, it is a wonder how in two decades, an overwhelmingly nationalistic Catholic stronghold has fallen to social justice and multiculturalism. The spiteful mutant theory postulates that before the Industrial Revolution, the advent of modern medicine and utilitarian criminal justice, undesirable genes were removed from the gene pool extremely vigorously. If you were born with detrimental genetic or mental disorders, the 40% child mortality rate probably killed you. Similarly, if you had damaging mental processes, you were probably killed at, off as a heretic or as a criminal. Somewhere within the realm of 2% of the male population was killed off every year as part of the medieval criminal justice system, but these were not normal people. These were abnormal dysgenic mutants that needed to be weeded out. If the majority of the human genome goes into the creation and development of the brain, physical and mental markers of dysgenics are easily noticeable. Whether it is facial asymmetry, left-handedness, or atheism, hygienic loads and signs of them were harshly discouraged. However, once child mortality had significantly decreased, healthcare became extremely easy to access, and the criminal justice system changed from physical punishment to reform, the number of mutants dramatically increased. The number of people with physical and mental disorders has been allowed to propagate. This also means that people with abnormal mental functions has been allowed to propagate. Feminism, atheism, and outgroup preferences, societal cancer that under strict Darwinian conditions would have otherwise been weeded out, have been allowed to propagate into main the mainstream discourse as mental mutants. These mutants are the other. They are the fringe that have hijacked the Protestant ethos of empathy for the downtrodden and transformed it ideologically into what the new reactionaries call the cathedral. Also within pre-modern conditions, birth rates among the rich and poor were relatively similar, but the death rates among the poor were much higher. Since the rich tended to have much higher IQs, this death mechanic selected for genetically heritable intelligence. However, in modern society, the rich and poor have children that are much more likely to survive. The poor also have, a, have significantly more children than the rich now compared to the medieval era. This means that in the long run, IQs will decrease, not dissimilar to the plot of the movie Idiocracy. Access to information, education, and nutritious food rises IQs to their phenotypic maximum, but dysgenics will eventually doom the industrial world, and pro uh, provided that there are no eugenic incentives to avoid this fate. Ireland, which which had some of the most stringent anti-abortion laws in Europe, had also industrially developed extremely late. It has also been over the last few decades that Ireland has opened itself up to international modern trade, technology, and ideas. Since the women that usually have abortions usually have narcissistic personality disorders, the number of spiteful mutants with personality disorders has been allowed to live and able to increase. The normal, healthy, pronatalist, pro-Ireland psychology and philosophy of the Catholic Church accidentally allowed for the number of spiteful mutants to grow and eventually take down the entire system. Meanwhile, international corporations like Apple and Google set up their headquarters in Ireland due to Ireland's tax-friendly economic policies. If you mix an increasing number of spiteful mutants, international capital gaining a foothold, with Catholic Church abuse scandals and horrific stories of mothers dying in birth due to the inaccessibility of abortions, you get the fall of Ireland. Google and Apple provide capital and propaganda to the spiteful mutants to bring feminism, abortions, and key rights to to Ireland. Dysgenic mutants that support outgroups and international capital which loves cheap labor combined to encourage third world immigration into Ireland. You will see the same people that protested in Occupy Wall Street, March and Gay Pride parades sponsored by Citibank. Dysgenic and complacent workforces are good for international capital, at least in the short run. That is how, within the last two decades, Ireland went from one of the most traditional Catholic nations in Europe, with a population of roughly 96% ethnically Irish, to a social justice global homo puppet, with a population that of only roughly 80% native Irish re residents. To talk about dysgenics and eugenics is heresy. You simply cannot address the problem, and if you do, you're a bigot. When Richard Dawkins says that eugenics would work, 
the scientific left came out in moral condemnation. Obviously, intelligence isn't heritable. Obviously, physical predispositions for body shapes are not a thing. Obviously, there is no use in encouraging good genetics. Intelligence has a heritability of roughly 0.8. Physique is obviously heritable, and people with severe heritable genetic disorders do have to ask the question of whether or not they want to condemn their child with a high chance of a horrific death sentence. To hammer home the point about international capital being in favor of third world immigration, Bernie Sanders notoriously called open borders a Koch brothers policy. Replaceable, rootless economic units are much easier to manage than when compared to rooted ethnicities. Desperation and high time preferences drive down wages, all else being equal. In terms of economics, this race to the bottom with regards to low school labor is immutable. Unions artificially increase wages and benefits above market equilibrium. Similarly, nations and their border controls prevent people best suited for a job from coming into the job market. Nations are just a large union, and unions are economically illiterate. Let the market be free to do whatever it wants. Open borders for everyone and anyone. It's not like there were native Irish people with hundreds of years of ancestry living there. By the way, discrimination against economic migrants is hateful and illegal. Legally enforced in-group preferences are economically efficient and morally repug repugnant to economists, so we might as well abandon them. However, as shown in Robert Putnam's well-researched book, Bowling Alone, multicultural, multi-ethnic communities kill the polis. Communities do best when they are communities of their genetic peers. Ethnocentric, exclusive communities with residents treat their neighbors as their kin, are extremely high in trust, civic, en civic engagement is high, and crime is low. You can feel confident in your altruism within your homogenous community because your community is you. Your genes are not only carried on by your children, but also your kin group in your community. When you have no incentive to care about your genetic line, you withdraw into your concrete apartment cell and watch Netflix alone. The philosophical underpinnings of this perverse societal change has always been the empathetic and industrious middle class. Lovingly classified as the rotten middle by 19th century British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, the educated, chattering middle class has always been the unflinching advocate of social disintegration. The middle class has always been susceptible to moral panics and social justice. It was the Protestant middle class that backed Oliver Cromwell against the Catholic English kings who were backed by the aristocracy and the poor. The puritanical, genocidal fanatic Oliver Cromwell's death was succeeded by the ascendance of Catholic Charles II, the king that brought back partying. Benjamin Disraeli led the One Nation Tory movement that united the wealthy lords with traditional poor against the liberal puritanical middle class. You also see that Boris Johnson unites the Etonian aristocratic educated class with the traditional working class against the elitist middle class labor snobs of London. The middle class has always been advocates of the policies of the spiteful means. The Chartist movement that extended the right to vote beyond the landed lords was overwhelmingly a middle class movement. I learned in my university's history of the modern Middle East class that early 20th century feminists of the Middle East were from the educated upper middle class. These Arabic women would speak to each other in French while planning the fall of the patriarchy. The man that coined the phrase survival of the fittest and popularized social Darwinism, Herbert Spencer, was also an early advocate of women's rights and women's suffrage. Later on in life, he retracted his support for women's suffrage when he realized that women would overwhelmingly support for socialism and em empathetically advocate for outgroup against the interests of the in-group. We live in John B. Calhoun's Mouse Utopia. During the 1950s through 70s, Calhoun conducted experiments in which several pairs of genetically fit mice were placed into a massive cage, fitted with plentiful room and unlimited food and water. The mouse population would skyrocket until things started to change in the mice's behavior. They started huddling in groups instead of spreading out. They would start biting each other. The males would bite and rape the females, and the females would bite their babies. Social breakdown and collapse. Mothers would reject their babies, males would fight, other males for sport. A special class of mice, nicknamed the beautiful ones, would withdraw from mouse society to live celibate lives of cleaning their fur alone. Eventually, the population would become so pathological that no baby mice were born or kept alive, and the mouse population died out. This closely mirrors the degradation of our cities. Humans, stripped of any real resource scarcity or purpose, either turn to pathological gangs or become sterile beautiful ones. 
philosopher Carl Schmitt could have told John Calhoun this decades before the Mouse Utopia experiments. In Europe and the West generally, the birth rates are significantly below replacement rates. To keep Western economic machines churning, violent alien third worlders are imported. Mass immigration has the detriment of both alienating natives from their tainted homeland and alienating natives from their trader outgroup supporting neighbors. What does the future look like? Global civilizational collapse? Economic catastrophe? Demographic destruction? Kaczynski's answer was to destroy the engines of economic and technological development. Nick Land's answer was is to have civilization accelerate so that the inevitable collapse is less terrible. It was found that if you placed mice that lived during the collapsing phase into a brand new cage, they could not start anew. Their connection to their original healthy societal structure had been severed. Maybe that's our fate. Maybe we're doomed. Or perhaps the singularity will save us. Being a replaceable part of a machine isn't so bad when you live in Robert Nozick's pleasure machine, doing whatever you want in the Matrix while your body degenerates. Maybe Derek Jensen was right in returning to a sustainable hunter-gatherer society is best for the Earth and our sanity. I'll let you come up with your own conclusions and praxis in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching.